And I don't know who the hell Meghan Markle thinks she's, that she's going to just sail in and decide. I don't like the way it's done, and you're going to change it for my convenience. I'm afraid that's not how life works. Hi, and welcome to Icon London Magazine podcast. Today, we're joined by New York Times bestselling author, royal biographer Lady Colleen Campbell, whose latest book, Meghan and Harry, The True Story, is set to be released in the UK and Europe on the 25th of June and in the US on the 25th of July. The book is currently available on Amazon on pre-order, so check the links down below in descriptions to get your hands on one. And without further ado, let's find out what awaits us on the pages of Lady Colleen Campbell's latest book. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Your latest book is set to offer a balanced account of game changers, conflicts and ambitions. With unique breadth of insight, Lady Colleen Campbell goes behind the scenes speaking to friends, relations, courtiers and colleagues on both sides of Atlantic to reveal the most unexpected world story since the abdication. Lady C highlights the dilemmas involved and the issues that lurk beneath the surface as to why the couple decided to step down as senior royals. Well, judging by the description alone, it sounds like a very thorough book. It is a very thorough book. I do not believe in doing anything that is not thorough, is not accurate, and will not stand the test of time. When I'm writing a book, I'm not writing it for tomorrow, and I'm not writing it for the approbation or criticisms of day after tomorrow. I'm writing it for somebody picking it up 50 years from now and saying, wow, that woman really knew what she was talking about. My books need to stand the test of time. So in the book description, it doesn't say, in the Amazon book description, it doesn't say who exactly you've interviewed. But in your video that you've recorded with Leo for YouTube, you do hint that you've had some information privy to the American PR team as to their rationale and their strategies. Is that fair? No, no. In my, in my YouTube videos, what I have said in answer to questions that were asked of me, is that Harry and Meghan's team have been getting in touch with me or trying to influence the narrative. Uh, Harry and Meghan's PR people are one thing that's come after I wrote the book. Before I wrote the book, mutual friends have got in touch with me and tried to influence the narrative. There's a big difference between mutual friends and Harry and Meghan's PR team. I wouldn't condescend to even, to even communicate directly with Harry and Meghan's PR team. I mean, spare me. I, do I look as if I'm Yosef Goebbels? I'm no minister of propaganda. <laughs> In my book, I do not specifically mention which members of the Markle family have said exactly what? Because they are private people who, through no fault of their own, have found themselves caught up in an international stink, uh, not of their making, and they certainly have not desired it, and they have, they have been extremely upset by the way they have been portrayed. But my children are friendly with Meghan's nephew, and I have had members of the Markle family stay here. Obviously, this, and this was long before I even started to write the book or considered writing the book. I am privy to information from them that I have included in the book. I do not quote any one of them directly because I believe in respecting the privacy of my sources. But you can be absolutely sure everything that I say in the book is true, 
and fair. I bend over backwards to hear it about and, and where praise is due to give praise. Why is it, in your opinion, that, that Megan is so worried and so concerned about your book that, you know, obviously she wants to bring her, her book date forward. What is it that you think she's so scared of? The truth, in a nutshell. <laughs> you know, oh, there are some people who do not like the truth. When I'm writing a biography, I make absolutely sure that I am so even-handed and so fair and so positive where I need to be. That not only do the critics of the subjects think, oh my God, she's been too fair, but the subjects of the biographers think, oh my God, she's been too harsh. <laughs> you have to offend everybody when you're writing a proper biography because you need to be completely even-handed. In your uh, video interviews, in YouTube interviews, you do mention Princess Diana and you mentioned that she tried and failed to change the narrative of the yes. story. My first Diana biography, Diana in Private, started out as an authorised biography written with her consent and approval. I even went into the palace about it. It was after Diana and I started to write the book that she decided at some point to change her story. And at that point, I realized that she was hijacking the narrative and trying to put spin on it because I knew she wanted a divorce and she wanted to get out of the marriage. She was trying to use my book as the vehicle. I was prepared to allow her to use it if she was speaking the truth. When I discovered she was not speaking the truth, I was not prepared to play ball. So we came to a parting of the ways. I, at that point, realized she was going to come up with someone else who would be her minister of propaganda. And sure enough, she came up with Andrew Morton, who did a brilliant job of saying half the rubbish that Diana told him, uh, which was half the time it was completely untrue. She tried to alter the narrative to suit herself. And I refused to play ball. So that's how that went. Harry and Meghan have got mutual friends where there's a very close, friendly connection to leak stuff to me, some of which was positive and I have put into the book, some of which I was absolutely appalled by, made my position very clear, uh, and I have certainly not put in that part of the narrative that they wished to put in the way they wished to put in. You know, I'm not going to be used by people to, in, to, to basically purvey lies. I'm just not prepared to do it. It's just not going to happen ever. Uh -oh. And I'm happy to purvey the truth. Both. I'm happy to prove a balanced account of a situation that anything that's really twisted so that it is complete fiction, you, I am not prepared to use. I leave that up to the Andrew Mortons and the Amid Scabies of this world. And life's given you a lot of lemons for pursuing the truth. And I think Nicola had some very good question as well about okay. well i was just curious obviously yourself coming from jamaica you were born in jamaica how i mean what are your thoughts on megan's claims that um everyone has it in for her because she's a woman of color entering the royal family because i'm jamaican and very proudly jamaican and in fact i have clung to my jamaican accent <laughs> throughout the whole of my life, even though I've not lived in Jamaica since I was 18 years old. But I see no reason to give up a perfectly nice accent 
because I'm very proud of being Jamaican. I am very aware of the tremendous honor that was bestowed upon Meghan Markle to represent people of color all over the world. I know from my Jamaican connections, I'm also friendly with various high commissioners, Commonwealth high commissioners. I know how tremendously vested hundreds of millions, if not billions of people all over the world have been in Meghan being a success and embodying inclusivity and, in, and embodying the fact that the glass ceiling no longer exists for people of color. And I have to tell you, I am bitterly disappointed that Meghan has thrown away such a gift as if the wonderful, beyond the price of rubies crown was a crown of thorns. She has, I think she has let down people of color all over the world. I do not speak for myself alone. I have interacted with hundreds, if not thousands of people of color. And mm -hmm. this is the theme that has come across. This is the common thread, that they are really disappointed that Meghan has bolted uh, and that Meghan, instead of being a woman of substance and taking criticism when it was valid, has tried to fob it off as if it were related to her color. Meghan's color worked in her favor. It did not work in her disfavor. She was embraced not only by the British royal family, the British establishment and the British public in a way that no Caucasian 36 year old D list minor starlet who had had a very checkered past would have been. <clears throat> had she not been a woman of color, she would not have been embraced the way she was. Her color worked very much to her advantage. And I am absolutely appalled that Meghan and Harry can allow their representatives in the United States to traduce the reputation of the British people and the British establishment and the British royal family and the British press who were not criticizing her because of her color, but because of her conduct. So do you think that taking on Sunshine Sachs was a big mistake and that Sunshine Sachs have created a worse image of of Megan than than she may or may not have already created by herself. I don't want to go into too much about what I regard as Megan's motives and Megan's decision in choosing Sunshine Sachs. It's in my book. It's too nuanced and too important an issue yeah. to do it in two sound bites. And I'm not going to do it in two sound bites. So it's something that we can read on the 25th of June? Absolutely. I look yeah. forward to it. <laughs> I know a lot of pro Megan fans do you blame British press for being too hostile? The reality is that all public figures get a rough ride from the British press because the British press has a long history of iconoclasm and satirical commentary. Meghan chose her position. Meghan chose to be in the public eye. There are lots of us like me who are in the public eye who did not choose to be in the public eye. There are others of us like 
Catherine Cambridge, who also chose to be in the public eye, and who had a very rough ride, as does everybody in the public eye, because the British press, the British tabloids love to sort of, you know, deflate the very people they're writing about. It is a well-known fact that anybody in that position, if they have any sense whatsoever, grins and bears it to the full extent that they are capable of. And as long as the press will not go too far and actually defame you, which they do on, on the occasional occasion, you do nothing. You just grin and bear it and you ignore it. You act as if it doesn't, it's not happening. So that's the way it has always been done. And Meghan Markle came into the British royal family claiming to know how the British press functioned, claiming to be well used to the tabloids. Of course she wasn't. Uh, she was not important enough to be tabloid fodder until she linked up with Harry. I think it's a great regret that she has misplayed her hand systematically. I do not know who Meghan Markle thinks she is, but I would recommend that she have sufficient modesty as to understand that there is an elaborate protocol governing the press and the royal family and their interactions these are two organs of the nation they have evolved over the centuries there are protocols in place to protect the interests of both there is latitude for error on the side of both all of this is in my, explained very carefully in my book, incidentally, uh, because it's a very important issue. And I don't know who the hell Meghan Markle thinks she's, that she's going to just sail in and decide, I don't like the way it's done, and you're going to change it for my convenience. I'm afraid that's not how life works. Uh, and I think it shows a tremendous lack of judgment on her part, and a tremendous lack of appreciation of protocols in this country which need to be respected. No public figure likes being mocked and criticized and made to look stupid. Uh, but everybody grins and bears it, and as long as it doesn't go too far. And I have to tell you, the British press have actually, and I include the tabloids in that number, have actually treated Meghan Markle very fairly. Her criticisms are misplaced because they have sat on a wealth of information that they could have imparted and chose not to. And that's the reality. I mean, you say, she, she regularly compares herself to Princess Diana in the way that she's treated by the press and she believes that, uh, that Catherine, Middleton, uh, Catherine Cambridge is treated very, very differently from the way in which she is treated. Do you think that's valid? Utter rubbish. Utter rubbish. Utter rubbish. Let's remember her, the rough ride that Catherine Cambridge got both before her marriage and in the early days of her marriage. And let's recall the dignity with which she responded. She did what every civilized, well-bred person who is not spoiled rotten and expects the world to alter itself for her convenience did. Catherine Cambridge ignored it, put her head down, went about her business, and continued leading her life. And it passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are somebody who has famously um, 
sued, successfully sued most of the British tabloids. Um, do you think that Meghan was right to be suing uh, with regards to the letter from her father being published? Or do you think she should have just ignored that and swept it under the carpet? There is a hell of a difference between me suing the tabloids for repeating libels that they knew to be untrue and which they knew my ex-husband and his brother had been paid considerable sums of money to tell about me in an attempt to earn themselves money. And Meghan Markle suing the Mail on Sunday for comments that her father was forced to make to preserve his reputation, a reputation that she and her, that she assisted her friends in seeking to destroy. On the one hand, I was suing because I wanted a very important truth to be told about me, while she is suing to bury a very important truth about herself. There's a hell of a difference between the two situations. They have no parallels whatsoever. Can I, uh, can I ask you, obviously, because obviously Catherine is now suing Tatler as well. Yes. With, uh, on, on the back of the whole Megxit. Well, well, I have a feeling you might discover that there might have been a little bit of misreportage. Okay. Because I, there is a big difference between suing a newspaper and asking a newspaper to take down a posting because there were inaccuracies in it. Mm -hmm. One, you are suing, the other, you are not suing. So I think we might find that the, that the lily has been a little bit overgilded in this instance. <laughs> obviously, when you wrote your books about Diana, there wasn't social media as there is now. And I've yeah. noticed that there has been uh, somewhat, there, there's been a, a deal of trolling um, against you um, on social media with regards to the book, the Megan book. Uh, I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? Yes, there has been a degree of trolling, but there has also been a greater degree of positivity. There, most of the comments, uh, I think about 70 or 80 or maybe 90% of the comments, I am told, are positive about me and my book. Uh, there are attempts made to divert the narrative into, you know, a pro megan and a pro stance. Well, my book is not anti megan mm -hmm. My book is pro megan when it should be pro megan and it recounts her errors, etc., and the consequences of them and the, and the reasons why they occurred. So, but I have been informed because I have a wide network of informants and some of whom have stepped very readily up to the plate and informed us that indeed some of those trolls have been created by Megan's team. They have been trying to divert the narrative there are even one or two sites that are supposed to be pro, that are supposed to be anti megan that have been set up by the Megan team to influence the narrative. I mean, it's, I have to tell you, it's, and all of this is very new to me because two months ago I had absolutely no comprehension of or experience of the internet and all of this. I'd never looked at any of it. I now do because of my, t uh, my YouTube show, Chatting with Lady C. And so I've become 
not expert, but I've certainly become exposed mm -hmm. to, to a completely new world. And yeah, Megan's team have been very active trying to denigrate me and trying to make out that I'm X, Y, Z, A, B, and C, when in fact I'm P, Q, and R, S, T, and U. <laughs> you know, which I have to tell you, I think is really rather pathetic. You know, I'm not going around telling lies about Meghan Markle, and I don't quite approve of the fact that she has her people going around trying to tell lies about me. I think it's low, and I think it's uncalled for, and I think she might live to regret it, aside from anything else. Because my book has so much about her that is positive, mm -hmm. I think she will ultimately realize when she's read the book that, in fact, that she has herself in the foot, but it wouldn't be the first time. Because Meghan Markle is one of those people who appears to be too clever by half and stupid by whole. You know, she's always busy manipulating and maneuvering. And uh, shades of Diana. Diana used to do the same thing. Constantly manipulating. Uh, and at the very moment that she had her hand in your pocket, denying that it was even near your being. Uh, and I just think people, when they behave like that, ultimately shoot themselves in the foot more than shooting anybody else. Her book is called The Making of a Modern Royal Family. Now, obviously, they've decided to renounce their titles. They've decided to move to Canada and then to America because they don't want to be in the public eye, allegedly. Um, is that a conflict by calling your book The Making of a Mo Modern Royal Family, where you're saying you don't want to be part of that royal family? The whole thing is ludicrous. The whole thing is preposterous. I mean, it's, you know, and people are, most people are not so brain dead as to realize that her book should have been called Funding Freedom. I mean, a, a lot of money has been spent by her. What? She has spent a lot of money on her wardrobe and her home and then deciding, you know, having spent the money on the home to then move to to America. Obviously, they, they, they have pledged the, the British public. Um, do you think that she genuinely is in love with Harry and, and genuinely wanted to try and make a change and make a difference and, and make the royal family more current and, and modern day? But the royal family, I would respectfully submit, was doing a very good job of being current and relevant before Meghan Markle came on the scene. Uh, they were at the peak of their popularity and had been for several years. Uh, she managed within two years of marrying Harry to all to the scenario to such an extent that he went from being the second most popular member of the royal family to utterly reviled. Uh, I think if she, if she really wants to be a player on the world stage doing humanitarian work, she had the God-given opportunity as a member of the royal family. You know, in the course of my 70 years, I have run across quite a few Meghan Markles. And there can be no doubt that you can spot them a mile off. And beyond that, I will not say any more. I'm not going to say whether I think she is genuinely in love with Harry or not. What I will say is that I have no doubt that he thinks she has been genuinely in love with him. And I also think going off other people I have known who 
were extremely ambitious and whose ambitions could be realized only through association with men, that for the full length of time that it was in their interest to tell themselves that they were totally in love with the man, they did. And there was always a dramatic volt force when they decided it was no longer in their interest to be worshipping at the altar of that God with whom they were so completely in love. Now, Megan does have a history of adoration, denigration, discard. Don't take my word for it. Ask Trevor Anderson or Nikki Preen. So more than that, I will not say. Do you think do you think Harry is happy? Do you think that he regrets his move to America? Do you think he regrets distancing Again, himself? I have, I have seen at very close quarters relationships that replicate Harry and Meghan's. There's nothing unique about it. Practically nothing under the sun is new. And when you've lived a lot, when you've lived as long as I have and have had as much experience as I have. You've practically seen everything, not everything, but practically everything. And certainly relationships where one party is completely in the thrall of the other party and the other party is quote unquote, desperately in love with that party. And much show is made of this great love. You get, you get a measure of what is really going on. And there's nothing unique about their relationship, really. It's, it's tried and true, it's happened. And I have seen very close up in my own personal the life, a, rep, a, a relationship that was a very similar to Harry and Meghan's, which is why when I am asked, do I think Harry will leave Meghan or is he about to leave Meghan, I give the answer that I give in the book. Because I, this is a subject I cover in the book because it's an important subject. It shows uh, what the dynamics are in their relationship. And I have used my own two eyes and I've listened to what's going, what I've been told. And it's, their relationship is very obviously one of total codependency. The problem with codependency is that it's usually only one of the parties in the codependency who is completely absorbed in the emotional aspects of the relationship. And I like how you mentioned the dynamics of relationships as well, because you have a vast experience. You're in a book, Daughter of Nar Narcissus, um, and you can recognize the yes. patterns of adoration, denigration, and discards. Yes, I do have a regret amount of experience in troubled relationships and I also have the experience of having survived them to such an extent that one of the world's greatest psychoanalysts Dr. Erica Freeman suggested that I write the book that I wrote called Daughter of Narcissus which is a serious examination of the of the question called narcissistic personality disorder. Now, narcissism is something that runs on a spectrum of say one to 10 or one to 12, whatever you, however you wish to put it. People who are fully blown narcissists usually also display the attributes of other personality disorders. It's almost impossible to find a true narcissist who doesn't also have sociopathic tendencies. Uh, so all 
I had to study the subject very comprehensively to be in a position to write the book. I wrote the book. It has been widely praised ever since I wrote the book for being, ex being accurate as to the subject and helpful to those who have endured the subject. Regrettably, personality disorders flourish more and more the higher up you go in the food chain. I am not in this interview going to go any further in so far as my this present book, Megan and Harry the Rare Story is concerned. But yes, I do have a lot of experience of the subject, and I also have studied knowledge of the subject. And I was encouraged by one of the great analysts, by one of the great psychoanalysts of all time to write the book. So I think that should tell you something as to my ability to not only have written such a serious book on such a serious subject and to have done so sufficiently effectively as to be praised for the contents of the book, but also to show that my eyesight in this area of life is 2020. And I sniff things out to mix my metaphors. <laughs> as, as, readily as, my, as readily as my dog, Mickey sniffs out prey. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much for sticking with this video till the end. Please do let us know what you think about the upcoming book in the comment section below. And don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you're really looking forward to the release of the book and you're gonna pre-order it and read it, or thumbs down if you're not really interested or not into it and you will not read this book. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. Over and out.